Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the Chicago Council program today. My name is Cecile Shea. I am a non-resident senior fellow and a special advisor to the Chicago Council. It's really an honor to host this exceptional program. If this is the first time you've joined the Chicago Council program, I just want to remind you we are an independent organization and a nonpartisan organization. The views expressed today are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Chicago Council. Um, after we have about a half hour of discussion, we will turn to questions from all of you. So please log in to ccga.live where you can ask questions and you can also upvote existing questions, ccga.live. I could spend the whole 45 minutes today giving the resumes of our three distinguished panelists, so I've had to abbreviate them. Speaking first will be Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, who represents the Illinois 8th Congressional District. He is a Democrat. He serves on the House Oversight Committee and particularly important to us today, he is a member of the House Select Committee on Intelligence. It's a sign of how impressed the House leadership is with him that immediately upon joining Congress, he was given two leadership positions as an assistant whip and as a member of the Speaker's Steering and Policy Committee. He is a Princeton graduate in mechanical engineering, a Harvard Law School graduate, and of a great source of pride to the Chicago Council, a graduate of our Emerging Leaders Program. We now have two Emerging Leader alumna up on Capitol Hill. Um, Congressman Sean Kasten is also one of ours. And so we're very proud of both of them. And if you know someone or are someone in your 30s uh, who is interested in global affairs and interested in leadership, please look at our website and continue, uh, consider applying for the Emerging Leaders Program. It's really a tremendous opportunity. Uh, following Raj, today we have two speakers of just legendary importance, not just in the U.S. Foreign Service, but in the foreign services around the world. Uh, starting with Ambassador Thomas Pickering. Ambassador Pickering has been the U.S. Ambassador to, working backwards, Jordan in the 70s, Nigeria in the early 80s, El Salvador during a very tense period in the mid-80s, Israel, you never took any easy jobs, did you? <laughs> Israel, um, mid to late 80s, the United Nations, India from 92 to 93, and then Russia from 1993 to 96. He also served as the State Department's Undersecretary for Political Affairs, one of the most powerful jobs in Washington. And um, I had the distinct pleasure to work with him from, from time to time during that period. Um, this is a time where we're all concerned about diversity in the workplace, and so it's worth noting that the program that is designed to bring in underrepresented persons into the Foreign Service is indeed named the Pickering Fellowship Program. So thank you, Ambassador Pickering, for your work in instituting and maintaining that program in an institution that is not always the most positive toward change. So thank you very much. Um, also appearing here today, is uh, another legend in the Foreign Service, Ambassador Alexander Sandy Virchbau. Um, ambassador Virchbau was the US ambassador to NATO a few years before our own Evo Dalder was there from 98 to 2001. Um, before that, or excuse me, after that, he was the US ambassador to the Russian Federation, um, succeeding Ambassador Pickering. He was also the US ambassador to the Republic of Korea, South Korea from 2005 to 2008. He was the White House's Senior Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council during the very important period of the Bosnian Civil War and the Dayton Peace Talks. And I was on the watch at that time, and I may have had to wake you up a couple hundred times, Ambassador <laughs> Bershbell, so I'm very sorry about that. And he was the State Department Director for Soviet Union Affairs from 88 to 91 when the wall came down. He, is the, he was the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs and was the first American ever to be the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2012 to 2016. So a warm welcome to you, Ambassador Virchbau, and thank you thank for you. being here with us today. So with that, I understand that Raj wants to give us a view from Capitol Hill. I'm certainly very eager to hear the view from Capitol Hill on Russia. So thank you. And following that, we'll open the conversation to Ambassador Pickering and Ambassador Virchbau. Hey, thank you so much, Cecile. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Excellent. Well, it's great to talk to you. Uh, it's great to be uh, among friends. And certainly, um, it's an honor to be the opening act to uh, Ambassador Virchbau and uh, Ambassador Pickering, who indeed are legends in the Foreign Service. Um, I should also say it's nice to be someplace they pronounce your name properly. 
Um, <laughs> it's a true story. When I first uh, ran for office uh, in Chicago, I said, hi, my name is Raja Krishnamurthy. And the person looking back at me in Chicago said, Roger Christian Murphy. <laughs> And he said, I didn't know the Irish made it to India. So in any case, uh, Ambassador Pickering, I'm sure that you, you uh, uh, would get the, um, uh, the humor uh, of, of Indian names being pronounced differently in different places. But um, it's an honor to be here. I do want to um, observe those three rules of Zoom speaking, be short, be sweet, and be gone. And so I have three points that I want to try to make. Uh, before you get into the meat of your discussion uh, with the two eminent ambassadors. The first point is that um, contrary to what national security Robert C. O'Brien said on Face the Nation this past Sunday, namely that, quote, the Russians have committed not to interfere in the 2020 elections. Guess what? They are interfering. And they are interfering actively and um, in a way that is very similar to what they did in 2016, um, though they might be doing it in even more sophisticated uh, manners uh, this time around. Um, I have a couple observations. Um, all of this is uh, based on what I've learned on the Intelligence uh, Committee in the House, uh, though obviously I'm not gonna get into classified information. Much of this is public. Um, FBI Director Christopher Wray, as well as the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, now that's John Radcliffe, have both said that the intelligence community consensus is that Russia continues to try to influence our elections by sowing discord, but also by taking active measures to denigrate Joe Biden and to promote Donald Trump. This is the intelligence community consensus. And how do they do that? They do that by basically um, using uh, Kremlin-linked actors uh, in social media to promote di social disinformation about Joe Biden, for instance, as well as uh, promoting Donald Trump. For instance, just recently, Russian-backed hackers uh, decided to go online and actively promote using bots and trolls the notion that mail-in ballots would lead to wide-scale fraud in the elections. It was almost parroting what we had heard on the stump from the president, almost real time. And they continue to do this. Um, they continue to publish uh, articles on uh, RT and Sputnik and other platforms that then you get used uh, by bots and others uh, to propagate throughout the uh, throughout the internet. Um, they are also continuing to do other things such as stealing Americans' identities on a wide scale and trying to place malware in election registration systems. We in Illinois are familiar with this because they attempted to do, th to do this in Illinois in 2016. They went to the Secretary of State database here in Illinois and tried to get, tried to get through the SQL entryway into our database to uh, fish around for identities of Illinois voters. At that time, they did not um, do any nefarious action beyond that, but they were probing. They were trying to figure out what are the weaknesses of our systems and our um, election uh, infrastructure here in Illinois, and they've done it elsewhere, and it appears that they are going to do it again the only, uh, only thing we have not yet seen from them that they did in 2016 was a, an active hacking and dumping operation, although we should be prepared for that as well. Um, there's still 26 days left until November 3rd, I know, because I'm seeking a contract extension on that day as well. And um, they are uh, well aware of the clock and they are well aware of the impact of their information um, on voting preferences going into November 3rd. The second area that I wanted to talk about, in addition to um, active runner, Russian interference in the current elections, um, is what we're trying to do on Capitol Hill in a bipartisan way to deal with Russia. Here, I've been working with several Republicans um, with regard to 
um, trying to assess in a formal way what the Russians intend to do with regard to NATO, our members, and us. Um, and specifically, um, I and Chris Stewart, a Republican from Utah, got signed into law actually by President Trump, something called the Kremlin Act, which directs the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to produce a national intelligence estimate that does three things. One, tries to figure out Russian intentions, uh, Russian military intentions with regard to NATO members. Uh, and there's a spotlight a little bit on Ukraine, by the way. Second, um, what is uh, the assessment with regard to Russian uh, responses to enlarged NATO and in, an even greater enlarged NATO presence in Eastern Europe going forward? And then third, um, what are the weaknesses and areas of division among NATO members that the Russians could seek to exploit against us going forward. We are waiting on this national intelligence estimate. Um, again, this is a bipartisan effort. I think there are a lot of people across the aisle who are equally disturbed by what they see, uh, you know, with regard to Russian intentions and activities. And so I'm glad to work with them. Um, I would like to have uh, a greater partner in the executive uh, with regard to this issue, but right now, at least my colleagues on the other side of the aisle legislatively are working with me on this particular um, issue. The third um, topic I wanted to briefly cover is active Russian military aggression against us. And here I want to touch for a moment on what you've heard about the bounty program in Afghanistan. Um, again, I can't get into classified information, but what I can tell you is that um, it appears that the Russians um, have um, expressed an interest in basically uh, offering rewards for harm to American soldiers in Afghanistan. Um, what bothers me is that the president so far has not expressed a great willingness to even investigate these allegations of Russians putting quote unquote bounties on American troops and what bothers me more is that he hasn't spelled out that if they are true, if they are true, that we are going to take countermeasures. Um, first, we have to make it clear there, it's completely unacceptable that anybody could put a bounty on our troops or harm them. Secondly, we cannot in any way allow the Russians back into uh, a normal international council, such as the G8, which the president wants to admit them to, um, uh, before we get to the bottom of this particular scandal. And then three, if it's true, we have to make it very clear that we are going to impose additional sanctions and perhaps take other measures to deal with the situation. The safety and lives of our troops are at stake, and the intelligence community feels fairly confident that they are under threat in Afghanistan and that there might be actors linked to the Russians here who are trying to do harm. So with that, um, I want to just say thank you for the opportunity to address you. Um, I know that you're going to have a much more robust uh, discussion going forward, um, but I just you know, wanted to kick it off with a few topics that are you know, top of mind, so to speak, for folks like me on the Intelligence Committee and um, in other parts of Congress as well. Well, thank you very much, Congressman, for your time and for that excellent and chilling overview of the situation um, of what Russia is doing here. Uh, we're nonpartisan, so I can't really wish you luck in November, but I know we all <laughs> certainly wish you well for the next month or so and, and look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for all of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassadors. Thank you, Cecile. Thank you, Raj. Okay, well, with that kind of... Uh, as I said, chilling overview. I, the first question that I have is how did we get to this point? You know, in the 90s, there were people talking about if we played our cards right, we might be able to encourage Russia to join the community of liberal democracies. And that clearly has not happened. So uh, how did we get to this point? And then we're gonna ask, what should we be doing about it? Uh, so Ambassador Birchbaum, could you get us started maybe? Yeah, thanks very much, Cecile. And it's uh, great to be a part of this uh, discussion, particularly with my colleague and former mentor, Tom Pickering. And uh, 
very glad to hear some very uh, strong words from uh, Congressman uh, Krishnamurthy. Uh, I think that the uh, roots of today's very poor relations between the West and Russia can be, be traced back to the time I was ambassador. Not that I'm to blame, uh, but uh, I arrived in Moscow uh, when we were still in the early Putin period. Uh, he'd been president for a year and a half, still something of an unknown quantity. Uh, and the relationship with George W. Bush got off to a relatively good start. This was, of course, the time of the 9-11 attacks. And uh, there was an extraordinary outpouring of solidarity and sympathy from the Russian people. Putin was the first to call President Bush to offer his support and help. So we had some real high hopes that, as you said, that this strategic partnership between us and, and the Russians could really be cemented. It's what we've been trying to build all through the 90s uh, under President Yeltsin. Uh, and we'd achieved a lot, even having Russian troops shoulder to shoulder with NATO troops in the Balkans. Uh, but this was seen as a, a real opportunity to take it to the next level. Uh, and I felt not only when I arrived in 2001, but all through my four years that the Russian people and the elite still wanted to be very much part of the West, uh, to be an ally, at least with a small a, with the United States. And uh, I was even, you know, as I traveled around the country, it was received very warmly everywhere, talking up the idea of the US and Russia becoming allies against common threats and united by common values. But uh, joining the West clearly wasn't what Putin had in mind. He had a, one, he had a different direction in mind for Russia. And uh, we saw in my first years uh, as ambassador, the beginning of the rollback of democracy, of independent media, uh, even uh, taking down some prominent critics uh, like Mikhail Khodorkovsky, taking them off the playing field. Uh, we weren't assassinating him at the time, but uh, uh, it was getting pretty tough. And uh, we were beginning to see, talk about a values gap growing between the West and Russia. Uh, we did achieve some things. The relationship had its ups and downs. Uh, strategic arms reductions, cooperation on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, but we had a falling out over the Iraq war, uh, over our withdrawal from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. But the real issue that I think led the relationship to an impasse, uh, and that's the connection to today, was our deepening differences over relations with Russia's former Soviet uh, neighbors. This was the time of the Rose Revolution in Georgia and the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which we saw as genuine grassroots movements uh, seeking greater freedom and democracy. Uh, but Russia, particularly Putin himself with his KGB background, saw them as US plots aimed at tearing these countries away from Russia and depriving it of its uh, sphere of influence in the so-called near abroad. So I think looking back, the Orange Revolution was the turning point that ultimately led to the breakdown in relations with the sort of the second Ukrainian re revolution nine years later, the Maidan. Uh, Putin really believes that we're seeking to promote democracy in, in Ukraine and in Georgia and in Russia itself as a way of bringing down his regime. Uh, he's determined to fight back, as the Congressman just said, by trying to undermine and disrupt our democratic institutions. Uh, since this is about regime survival for Putin, uh, it makes me very pessimistic that there's going to be any easy way forward to uh, uh, build a better relationship, to go back to the idea of a partnership with Russia, at least for some time to come. But we do have to talk to the Russians, negotiate with the Russians, try to manage the relationship, reduce risks, but that may be about the best we can do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent overview. Ambassador Pickering, do you have anything to add to how we got to where we are? And, and then can you then kick off the discussion on what should we be doing, given um, some of the egregious behavior that we're hearing about? No, I agree with what Sandy has had to say. One thing impressed me around the election of 2011-2012 for the Duma in Russia, where it became quite clear that both Putin and Medvedev <clears throat> had to delay reporting the election results for quite a long time into the early morning. And it appeared to be a, an essentially an administrative finagle to make sure that he actually won. And some of what I think propelled him certainly at that point was to reinforce and strengthen the parties, the policies 
of Russian nationalism, of kicking the U.S. in the ankles and sometimes higher up, of trying to divide the U.S. from Western Europe, of finding ways to exert some kind of sphere of influence in the neighboring former Soviet area and perhaps beyond, uh, recover what he obviously saw was a, a loss of their putative great power, uh, even claims to co-equal status. And much of this, if not originated, was driven in part by what was clearly a threat to him uh, and the loss of the regime, which Sandy has mentioned and with which I agree very much. Um, in my time, uh, I arrived while almost everybody in power was still a communist and had no way of understanding or figuring out how to go. Uh, there was tension in meetings. There was pushback. Uh, there was a sense that uh, in one way or another, they had fallen on perilous times, uh, deep despising of Gorbachev for having gotten them into this fix and not a good sense of a way out, a struggle on their part to absorb and think about ways to proceed uh, into the international community uh, and very strong influence by the United States. I would not minimize that. Uh, we had unfortunately numbers of people, so many from the private sector who thought they knew the answers to this problem uh, and we're not in any way at all, and I was ambassador at the time, coordinated, and it was not easy uh, to have a common view or to bring people together around a common approach. And a U.S. judgment that, in fact, Russia would swoon into the arms of embracing uh, capitalism and participation in a democratic international community uh, merely because they had done so badly under communism, and no, none of that happened. Uh, and so we're certainly misjudgments, uh, misactions, and problems on both sides. Uh, I'd like to just make a few remarks, picking up on, again on what Sandy said. Um, we are in a bad way. There isn't, in my view, perhaps a worse time, except if we go back to Cold War, uh, probably before and immediately after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and in some ways, the Cuban Missile Crisis was an interesting event because over time it took on a significance as we knew more about it, uh, that we came close enough to what I would call a nuclear exchange and kept out of that in large measure because of John Kennedy's and his brother's appreciation of the uh, tragedy that would create, uh, that we began a process of diplomatic contact in a more intensive way to try to build some nuclear stability. Uh, and uh, I think communications is important. It doesn't exist now. I think in large measure because Putin has resisted it, because he has found ways to attack and harass our diplomats, to cut off our uh, activities in Russia that are important uh, to further uh, build popular support for the idea that uh, uh, Russia has a future in the international community which is not uh, isolating itself as it has done in Lost Friends. I do not believe that miracles are around the corner if we reestablish diplomatic communications, but I think they're important things to do. And one of those stemming out of the Cuban Missile Crisis is to not let the arms control structure that we certainly, it needs repair and improvement, uh, go down to below zero by not taking the option built into the new start arrangement uh, for a renewal of five years or more that comes due in the first week in February uh, and very close to the inauguration uh, with the present administration uh, seemingly still discussing that issue. Recent reports have been a little more optimistic, but it seems to have had, even with the disappearance of John Bolton, who was the primary champion in the administration of getting rid of this agreement, uh, seemingly uh, looking as if uh, it is not going to happen and the, the election will determine, obviously, 
whether a new administration will be elected that will do that. Uh, but that's potentially a takeoff point. Putin has made it clear that he wants to do that. Uh, and I think that that's a significant piece. I've always thought that the uh, U.S. and the Soviet Union in the old days and U.S. and Russia now are only going to be tied together if they look at the question of the existential threat uh, that uh, a bad, sloppy, miscalculated, and potentially accident-prone nuclear posture on both sides could lead us uh, to the worst kind of nuclear exchange. And while the chances aren't high, I've always thought that uh, 0.25% of a nuclear conflict was worth spending a lot of time in diplomacy and a certain amount of time in backing up our diplomacy to try to resolve. So I put that on the table uh, and uh, am pleased that both Sandy and I have, a, I think, an appreciation of the toughness of doing that, but also the importance of seeking to try to open those doors. And, and final point is, um, there are two ways in general to proceed with that kind of effort. Uh, we used to call it reset. That was something of an object of some hilarity when mistranslations of the word struck the process. But I think that it is, uh, uh, one way is to do small things and build confidence. Another is to do a rather large thing. I think the large thing impels itself on us now if keeping New Start alive is out there, could be followed by another look at what might be a next stage. That will be very hard. Uh, we do cooperate with Russia on a number of things. I don't have to go tick them off, but they're not high value, high importance, but they're not trivial. Things like terrorism and drugs and some mutual interest, despite the bounty program in not having Afghanistan uh, go south, if I could put it that way. Uh, and a, a number of other things, certainly our space cooperation has had elements of usefulness to both of us. So we are in a point where uh, finally, uh, if Trump's sweetheart relationship with Putin, the drivers of which are unknown but highly suspect, uh, is going to be the overall uh, uh, driver of our policy, uh, I think that's as bad as essentially uh, trying to run a policy of maximum pressure without converting that, hopefully, into some kind of diplomatic contact that can get us somewhere. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Just a reminder to those of you who are joining us, please go to ccga.live, ccga.live, and uh, ask some questions of these two great men. Um, you, you bring up an interesting point, though. You know, throughout the Cold War, Russia was involved in assassinations in other countries. It was involved in mucking around in elections. It was involved in a lot of uh, inappropriate behavior. But I don't remember them doing too much of that in the United States or in Great Britain or in Western Europe. I mean, that is the shocking thing to me. I mean, the polonium poisoning happened two blocks from the U.S. Embassy in London. So... Well, does that concern you too? I mean, just the, kind of the brazenness of some of the things that are going on in here in the United States. And again, is there anything that we can do? Raj brought up a few, a few points. Um, is there anything that we can do or do we just need to shed more light on these things and not kind of look the other way when they occur? Right, Sandy, do you have an opinion? Yeah. Well, the Russians have been doing a lot of these things for a long time, but they weren't quite as skilled as they are now, and they didn't have the uh, advantage of social media and other tools that are now yeah. uh, accessible to anybody to kind of have a much greater impact than they did when they helped publish Communist Party newspapers and supported uh, you know, Gus Hall's U.S. Communist Party. This stuff was kind of uh, fringe activities that didn't really uh, destabilize our society the way that they're able to do now. Uh, and it is true, as you said, that they're becoming more brazen in terms of assassinating people on the territory of, uh, of Germany, of the UK, uh, carrying out this aggressive cyber and information war here in the United States. Uh, so we have to assume that this is going to be here to stay. And you know, we have to try to 
fight back in ways that deter the Russians from uh, going too far. But I think the main thing we have to do is reduce our vulnerabilities. It's about education so people don't uh, fall prey to uh, extremist uh, narratives that the Russians promote uh, or uh, become uh, you know, deceived by some of the tr trolls and the internet research agency that are pumping out this stuff. Now, of course, the Russians don't even invent the content right now. They can find uh, all kinds of crazy extremist uh, stuff on the left and the right, right here in the USA. They can go to the president's Twitter feed and get all the, uh, the raw material they need to try to discredit our whole political process and uh, you know, the integrity of mail-in ballots and everything else. So uh, we have to, uh, first of all, get our own internal house in order, reduce our vulnerabilities so that the Russians don't see such advantage in conducting these activities. But I think it also kind of raises broader questions that Ambassador Pickering was, uh, was talking about. I mean, we have to, first of all, recognize that the relationship is not just bad, but it's dangerous. Uh, there is a real risk of, uh, of escalation of some small incident that could get out of control. Uh, the arms control architecture is pretty much all gone. The new START agreement is the last surviving piece. And I'm not convinced the Trump administration is sincerely trying to find a basis to extend it, although I hope I'm wrong. Uh, so we need to revive arms control. We need to think of other ways to reduce the risks of accidental confrontation uh, in ways that we were able to do during the Cold War, because it, it, it is worse than it was you know, under Brezhnev. We, we were able to reach agreements with Brezhnev and kind of have some kind of mo modus vivendi. We agreed on the Helsinki Final Act, which established all the principles that are now in, in empowering uh, human rights and democracy in the former communist lands. So uh, Putin is taking us back to an even darker time. And we have to be very realistic about that. Uh, I, I think that we, you know, we have to be realistic. We have to be patient. Don't rush into another reset without getting some very clear uh, concessions in return. Uh, I think the big enchilada in all this is what happens in Ukraine and the other neighboring states. Uh, we really can't compromise on the sovereignty of independent states. And the Russians themselves signed up to the principle that all states' sovereignty should be respected. You shouldn't change borders by force. They've trashed all those rules, but those are still the only basis to have a an orderly international system. So uh, we have to make Russia pay a price for its aggression, while at the same time trying to stabilize the relationship against military risk. It's a tough balancing act, uh, but uh, we have to deal with Russia as it is, try to calm down the tensions, reduce the risks, but, but st stand by our principles when it comes to the, the rights of sovereign states like Ukraine and uh, human rights inside Russia itself. Uh, particularly in light of what we've just seen with Mr. Navalny. So it's, it's, a, tr it's a tricky game. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on now, lots of open letters and counter letters. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, there's a general agreement that uh, you know, we have to be firm with Putin, find ways forward, but not have high expectations that Putin wants to improve relations with us. And it does take two to tango. Right. <laughs> so that actually brings Thank up- you. Could I just Cecile, could I make a yeah, go ahead. Just a go ahead, Ambassador, please. brief comment, if I can, because you've been asking the right questions, and this is a, an important focus, and what Sandy has, I think, has certainly laid it out very well. I would say the following, that um, to expect uh, Russian intelligence activities to stop uh, is perhaps a triumph of hope over reality. Um, I would have to say, too, and, and I don't know much more than this, but I've been around the government a while, to expect ours to stop in the same way would uh, represent the same sort of question. I think that uh, Sandy's right that some of the klutz factor that characterized some of the Soviet stuff for the ability to work at low grade, low impact questions because uh, we didn't really spend a lot of time with them uh, are perhaps real. On the other hand, you can't say that the use of Novichok as a poisoning agent or polonium, uh, which takes us right back to Russia, is in a sense a question of deep disguise of their approach. One might have thought they could find some more esoteric poison that was less uh, traceable to their doorstep. Uh, and maybe that's what they wanted, because some of what they have been doing 
including murders of political figures in Russia, uh, have been designed to make sure that there is no uh, domestic opposition, that perhaps there are no defections among Russian intelligence agencies, uh, perhaps to make sure that in one way or another, uh, Putin is not in any, pa in any fashion in danger. I also think that uh, the importance of defending ourselves actively is very serious. Uh, and there's an old, you know, there's an old saying, uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. This is something that we need to take into account because shouting at the Russians and I think even intensive sanctions uh, are not, uh, in my view, necessarily the answers. It is our own active defense efforts, particularly against hacking and other intrusions that should play a role in our capacity uh, to deal with this challenge. And if it isn't from Russia, it'll be from China or from other players, some friends and allies perhaps. So we know from this business that's a question. The second thing I'd like to mention is that as we look at Russia, there are many who are deeply worried that China is the number one problem, and they may be right, uh, but that China and Russia together may be the future giant problem. And I'm not so sure that they're right. I think there are still more questions between China and Russia that lead each side to have reservations about the other, including the fundamental question of who leads in that, in that diarchy. Uh, but I also think it's important that we conduct our policy not to make that happen, not in what uh, will be an effort that we put so much pressure and so much isolation on each of those parties and do not deal independently with them in ways that can help to keep them separate from each other in some kind of new lash up uh, is very, very important. Uh, Henry Kissinger first dealt with this kind of uh, mariage a trois in making uh, on the basis that he never would conduct a policy that allowed Russia and China uh, to have as a result uh, newfound efforts to pull themselves together. So, you know, and mentioning China is interesting because you have both said that we have to do a better job, and this gets to a couple of the questions that have come in, a much better job of protecting ourselves against hacks, against, I would say, election interference, and also protecting our human capital from the kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, from the kind of interference that occurs on Facebook and in, across social media. And speaking of China, I was in Taiwan in the lead up to their election, and uh, you want to see a, a election interference, just see what happens when a country that has a million soldiers that they can put on a task uh, goes to work on a little country like Taiwan. And Taiwan, to its enormous credit, had a tremendous plan for educating its own population on how to recognize its problems, as well as keeping its own infrastructure safe. And so if we do develop plans for educating our own populace, both in you know, the mechanical side of keeping safe, but also kind of the recognizing interference when you see a side, that will also help it as we deal with an emerging China, it seems to me. Um, we, have, we have two minutes, so I, I, I'm gonna go two minutes over. So let's take two minutes to answer one question that has come in, and then two minutes to let you both, um, to, to let you both offer some final remarks. Um, there's a specific question about Russia's dealings with Belarus. Let's broaden that to say, what should the U.S. be doing about Belarus right now? And more broadly, what should the U.S. be doing about, you know, the countries? I, we heard a little bit from from um, Ambassador Bershbaugh about the Ukraine, but, you know, about the other countries in the immediate orbit of Russia to, to help them in any way that we can, or should we be helping them? Because there are plenty of Americans who say we shouldn't. So open question. Uh, Maybe I could start that one. I, I'm sure Sandy has great ideas, but I would say strengthen our alliance relationships to exploit the problems that Russia has with both Ukraine and Belarus, uh, rather than to try to launch off on our own in some kind of misguided effort to uh, one way or another please Putin or otherwise collapse. Uh, Belarus is not going to be easy, but popular opposition remains strong. And it's Putin's support of Lukashenko, which is gradually, I think, taking more of a role in the outcome of this. And I am not particularly sure how we can 
push back against that except to unite the international community against the continuation of Lukashenko and see whether in fact a combination of pressure points, whether it is economic sanctions or more isolation, uh, can begin at least to lay down markers. And I think that we should play a much more active role in Ukraine with Germany, France, uh, and the United Kingdom in what was the Normandy group, uh, that we should push hard to get Minsk arrangements carried out in a, in a responsible way rather than in a haphazard and, and sloppy way. Uh, so I, I think those are things. Our great uh, capacity in the international community has been buttressed by our ability to form alliances, and Sandy was a leader of one of them, and he will know better than I about that. But they're not devoid of possibilities. They're not devoid of strength. And as long as Putin remains internationally isolated, his pretensions at great power or status, and indeed his own reputation among his own people uh, is under threat, and that's the kind of way hopefully we can push to get some gains. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador Vershka, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I fully agree that we need to uh, work with our allies and we rebuild our alliance relationships after a lot of, uh, shall we say, erosion uh, under this administration, even though NATO still as an institution is quite strong, but the political ties are getting increasingly frayed. Uh, but I think a united response is critical if we're going to influence Russian behavior down the road. It may not happen overnight, but you know, standing united, imposing costs, whether it's sanctions or other political measures, uh, if they continue in occupying illegally parts of Ukraine and Georgia and other, other neighboring countries. Uh, since we're not gonna actually bring them into NATO tomorrow and go to, go, to, go to war for Ukraine, we need to do the second best thing, which is to help them defend themselves. And I think that's one area where the Trump administration has been pretty good in giving the Ukrainians weapons, not to fight to the finish, but to deter the Russians from going any further. Belarus is a much trickier case uh, because the popular revolt there isn't as it was in Ukraine about uh, joining the West, about becoming uh, members of NATO and the EU. Uh, they just simply were fed up with the same leader for two and a half decades and wanted to have a real election and be able to choose their own leaders. I think that's still what they're asking for. And I think it's, it's in Russia's interest to find a way to guide Mr. Lukashenko into an early retirement, have new elections, uh, and I think we should be doing everything we can to encourage that kind of an outcome, because if we suddenly make the stakes as high in Belarus as they are in Ukraine for Putin, he'll overreact and will make the situation perhaps impossible to resolve. So it requires a kind of diplomatic, fin diplomatic finesse and nuance that President Trump isn't known for. Uh, but uh, right now, the U.S. is kind of passive. Uh, the, you know, with the election coming, maybe that's understandable, but we were passive there, we're passive in the uh, uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan case, we're not doing much to counter the Russians in Syria. Uh, we, we need to have a real policy, we need to get our allies to, to pull in the same direction uh, if we're going to influence Russian behavior. Well, thank you both very much. I wish we had more time, but we don't. Could I give you each 30 seconds? What do you wish people would say to their elected representatives about Russia? What should they be asking of their president, their vice president, their congressman, or their senator concerning Russia and the region right now? My view is that we should stand up to what we have been talking about here, which is essentially we need to continue to push back strongly, particularly on the areas of the most egregious ac activity. And we have to do the much more sophisticated thing of see if we can reestablish communications on the basis that we have to translate what we're doing on the form of pressure into diplomatic gains, which will help us build some stability and take away what I think is potentially, as, as Sandy noted, an existential threat uh, to both countries because we both have the nuclear capacity uh, to create that threat. Excellent, thank you very much. Thanks, Ambassador Vershbaugh. Yeah. Uh, I agree that with that. We, we have to recognize that it's a competitive relationship and will remain so at least for the next few years. Putin could go as long as 2036, but uh, in, in the short term, we should focus on managing the, the competition, not compromising our principles on issues like Ukraine, uh, 
but at the same time, don't write off a better future for Russia. I think it's not uh, Russia's destiny to be a, a despotism that uh, tries to subjugate its neighbors. They've done that a lot over the years, but we saw a better Russia beginning to emerge under Gorbachev and Yeltsin. Uh, they made a lot of mistakes. We made some mistakes too. Uh, but I think we see in the protests in Khabarovsk and in some of the other uh, signs of restiveness on the part of the Russian population, that uh, there may be opportunities down the road uh, for re-establishing re at least some kind of partnership between Russia and the West, and you know, going back to where we thought we were going in the 1990s and, and even in the early Putin years. So uh, prepare for a better future with Russia, but be realistic about the Russia that we're dealing with today. Thank you very much. Uh, words to live by, very profound, profound, and I know we all hope for a far better future for the Russian people. Um, and for U.S.-Russian relations, certainly. Thank you so very, very much, Ambassador Thomas Pickering, Ambassador Sandy Bershaw. It's been an honor to see both of you. Ambassador Pickering, you have got to do an exercise video. I do not know what you're doing, but you look fabulous. So thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all of you. Thank we'll you, see you in <laughs> Great to join you both. Thank you, Sandy, very much. Uh, great to be with you, Cecile. Best to Eva. And thank all of the folks who made this possible. And, and certainly on my behalf, it was a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Great discussion and uh, Congressman gave us some good food for thought as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye.